to be influenced by experience. And certainly that's true, and we're going to focus on that exact aspect of human existence in one of our lectures in this course. But another quality that characterizes humans is our enormous range of emotional response. So our emotions help engage us in the world. And our emotions are like color is for vision. Remember I said that we could differentiate up to 6 million hues of color. Well, our emotional life is like this vibrantly rich palette of internal subjective experience. We have this incredible range of emotions that we're capable of feeling. And it's our limbic system allows that to occur. In our last lecture, we looked at depression, where you might think of it as very black, the blackness of despair and hopelessness. But in addition to the depths of depression, we're also capable of the most intense joy and an exuberance of life. And so much so that great thinkers like Sigmund Freud thought that there was actually a life instinct or a pleasure instinct in human beings. We have this ability to feel such joy in our lives. And so we're very complex organisms. Our limbic system is very complex, and it allows for this broad range of emotional interaction with the world. In this lecture, I want to talk with you about a subsystem of this mega limbic system. And this subsystem is the system that's responsible for creating that internal positive or euphoric feeling we have when we engage in pleasurable activities. So whether that's reading a book, whether it's viewing a sunrise, whatever it is, maybe taking a course, doing something that we enjoy, this is the system that is tapped into. This system is also involved in uh, uh, very pleasurable feelings that are associated with the body, um, even something as simple as thirst. If you're very, very thirsty, remember how that water tastes when you take that first swallow. It just tastes marvelous. And you just have this sense of joy um, that comes from that. So there are a lot of different kinds of joy that we experience in our lives, and that's one of the points of this lecture. We have this broad palette again of emotions just like color. And what we want to talk about now are the ones that are on the high end of that um, experience, the ones that we experience as joy of life. Now, what neurotransmitters would be involved in this subsystem in our limbic system, this subsystem that lets us appreciate the joy of life? Well, it's the monoamines again. So increasing the levels of monoamines increases feelings of well-being. And that's part of what we're talking about. If there's a continuum and we're talking about these feelings up on this end, then obviously the monoamines are going to be involved in it, increased feelings of well-being. We saw in the last lecture that at least in some individuals who report being depressed, giving drugs which increase the level of monoamines or facilitate monoaminergic transmission actually help people be less depressed. These antidepressant drugs, however, actually primarily target serotonin and norepinephrine, and we'll come back to why that's important. But we know from just everyday observation, and think about our own lives, we seek out activities that bring us pleasure or some kind of reward. And so what we want to talk about is the very subsystem in the limbic system that allows that to happen and contributes to this sense of well-being. These and other observations are just about normal life and about how antidepressants uh, can help individuals who are depressed led us to believe that there, this internal subjective sense of euphoria even, of a joy of life, had to have a biological substrate. And we know that the cortex is involved ultimately and had to be because we have this internal subjective sense of joy, of tapping into this joy of life. And so we knew that that was so. And this subsystem of the limbic system in general 
is referred to as the endogenous reward system. Endogenous meaning that it's a system that naturally occurs in the body, and in this case the brain, that specifically is meant to be involved in helping the individual seek out pleasurable activity, to engage outside of oneself, to again engage in the world. And this is what our limbic system is about. So this is a specific system that allows us to tap into the joy of life and um, is of great interest to neuroscientists. This system can be conceptualized as both neuroanatomical and biochemical. And by now in the class, you've already figured that that's true for any kind of function that relates to the brain. So in an anatomical sense, it's going to consist of a sort of subset of nuclei and pathways in the limbic system And on a biochemical level, it's going to involve particular neurotransmitters or neuromodulators. So let's begin with identifying the nuclei of the limbic system that are specifically involved in being part of this endogenous reward system. Now, a number of nuclei are involved. We're going to revisit some of this. But let's just talk about where they're at and the major players in this endogenous reward system. The first is the ventral tegmental area. The ventral tegmental area is this tiny, tiny little group of neurons that are in the midbrain. So if you remember, the midbrain is midway between the forebrain, which is rostral, and the hindbrain, which is caudal. So the midbrain is just a little strip of tissue in between the other two main divisions of the brain. And so the midbrain has little groups of nuclei, little tiny groups of nuclei, and the ventral tegmental area is one of them. You also remember that the midbrain is also called the mesencephalon. So midbrain and mesencephalon mean the same thing. This tiny little group of neurons that are in the mesencephalon, the VTA, or ventral tegmental area, are going to give rise to two major projections out. One will be to limbic system structure. So that's called the mesolimbic projection. And another one of the projections is going to be to the cortex, which is called the mesocortical projection. Here's our ventral tegmental area here, and it's going to have a major projection to a limbic system structure called the nucleus accumbens. And it will also have a major projection to the cortex and these are called mesocortical. So this is mesolimbic, and the projection here is mesocortical. And if you read any books that talk about the endogenous reward system, they will talk about these two major types of projections. So the ventral tegmental area, this tiny little area in the midbrain, which we will see later utilizes dopamine as a neurotransmitter, basically has two major projections, to a limbic system nucleus and to the cortex, specific areas of the cortex. So the other anatomical sites that are important in this system will be the targets of the ventral tegmental area. So the first one is the nucleus accumbens septi. And the nucleus accumbens septi is the target structure of that mesolimbic projection. So it goes to this structure. Now, this is a drawing, or this is actually a Weigert section, showing uh, where the nucleus accumbens is located. It's located right here in the brain. This is a section in this plane through the brain. These are the holes in the brain, our famous ventricles up here. And this structure was called by early neuroanatomists a septum. So this nucleus, which looks like it's a continuation of that, was called the nucleus accumbens septi. The septum really separates the two parts of the ventricles and the two hemispheres. But this nucleus is so large in human beings that you can actually see it on the Weigert sections of the brain. So it's actually very large. Note that the ventral tegmental area, which projects to it, is tiny. But the target of this mesolimbic projection is a very large nucleus. Now, the nucleus accumbens septi is very important. It turns out that every single case of drug addiction 
or any other type of addiction involves that nucleus. So nicotine addiction, cocaine addiction, when people become addicted to alcohol, um, and we're also newer studies show that gambling addictions, sexual addictions, pornography addictions, other types of addictions involve this nucleus. And this nucleus is critically involved in this system of reward. And so it will be one of the nuclei that's involved in the seeking behavior of the person going after that thing which is bringing them pleasure. And so it's critically involved um, in this behavior. The last area, which is anatomical subdivision of this endogenous reward system, are to cortical areas. And the cortical areas that are involved are going to be predominantly this orbital frontal area of the cortex again. We'll come back to the significance of that. But remember, this was the area of the brain that Phineas Gage had that rod go through. This was the primary area of the brain that was involved in him. And we'll come back to the fact that this is one of the main areas that that ventral tegmental area projects or uses that dopaminergic projection. This would be the mesocortical projection. So just to review a little bit, we have three main nuclei or areas. The ventral tegmental area, which is located in the midbrain, which is also called the mesencephalon. These ventral tegmental neurons give rise to the mesolimbic, which is to the nucleus accumbens septi, and the mesocortical, which is to prefrontal cortex. Now let me add a little bit of information to this. This projection of the cortex is not just random to the cortex. It's to the orbital frontal cortex, but particularly in the left hemisphere. This is a system involved in reward. And you may not remember this, but back when we talked about stroke, I said that strokes of the left hemisphere often lead to depression. And we weren't really sure why that happens. Well, it turns out that stimulation of the left free frontal areas increases feelings of well-being because the left prefrontal area in this orbital region is involved in this endogenous reward system. So it goes back to the idea that our hemispheres have many things that are just really involving one hemisphere a little bit different than the other hemisphere, that there's a hemisphere lateralization to some functions. Now, this is how the system is defined anatomically. What about biochemically? Well, biochemically, the reward system, its major player, neurotransmitter, is going to be dopamine. So dopamine is one of the catecholamines, and it's also one of the monoamines. So dopamine is the major player here. It's involved in that ventral tegmental projection to both the nucleus accumbens and the cortical projection. So that's a very, very essential one. So this projection from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens and also the mesocortical to the orbital frontal cortex uses dopamine as a neurotransmitter. And I'll bet that you can guess, without remembering what was up on the screen, what the other two major chemical players are in the reward system. Think about it. Reward. Feel good? Yes. Well, it's going to be the opiates and the opioids and the oxytocin. And so these also overlap with the dopaminergic projections. And this is going to be very important when we come back to examining what happens in individuals who take certain kinds of drugs or affect their brain in one way or another, that these systems will also be involved. So it seems like a very simple system. There are only a few nuclei and pathways that appear to be involved in this endogenous reward system that allow us to tap into the joy of life, which seems like a big thing. And it's also fairly simple on a biochemical level, but a very, very important one in human beings. So what's the experimental or clinical evidence that led to a conclusion that these nuclei and transmitters were involved in some kind of endogenous reward system? And before I go on to that, there's our little lovebirds again and the oxytocin flowing. So what is the evidence that activation of this system causes an 
internal subjective sense of joy or an internal subjective sense of elation or feeling good or feeling a joy of life. What's the evidence for that? Well, let's begin with the evidence from animal research. Um, this has a special significance for me. Um, there were areas when I first began in neuroscience some of these areas had already been identified that could be stimulated in animals and could produce uh, feelings of intense pleasure. And I'll tell you how we made that conclusion that that was true. But this is how I was taught to do brain surgery in animals. I was taught to implant electrodes into their brain in these pleasure areas. And these animals were then trained to press a bar in order to get electricity through these electrodes to stimulate these areas of the brain. And we could tell if I'd actually learned how to do the brain surgery because the animals would then bar press to get that jolt of electricity. If I was off in my placement of the electrodes, the animals would not uh, press the bar to get the, the uh, jolt um, of activation of the system. So this has its own significance for me. Um, these are tiny areas in the rat brain, and so you have to learn very specifically about how to target areas of the brain. Now, the thing that's critical here is that an animal who has electrodes in this area of the brain, in the area around that nucle what in the humans is called the nucleus accumbens septi, these animals will bar press, and they will not eat, drink, and they will even refuse sex to be able to have access to the bar, to press the bar for self-stimulation. The animals will bar press to exhaustion. And there are films of animals totally exhausted, lying on their side, with their little paws up on the bar, just hitting it one more time, completely exhausted. And the animals will starve to death if they are not forced to eat and drink. So this is how we interpret that there's something very positively rewarding about what's happening when you stimulate these areas of the brain. These areas of the brain are stimulated under natural conditions uh, that involve uh, eating and drinking and sex, and also unnatural conditions like uh, electrodes implanted in the brain. And so um, they're activated in both cases. Also, if you lesion these areas in an animal, then the animal will not bar press to stimulation. So you can block that stimulation effect by doing particular things in animals. We believe that these areas of the brain are involved in the reinforcing aspects of pleasure. So when things are pleasurable to us, we seek them out again. And part of it is because we're motivated to do so because we have this underlying subsystem which is in fact designed to do that. The seeking behaviors involved, these are all things that allow us to go out, engage in the world in such a way that it brings pleasure to us. Now, in animals, you also have certain drugs can hijack the system. It happens in humans as well. Drugs like cocaine artificially stimulate these very same pathways. And so you have animals that will press a bar to get a hit of cocaine. And just like the uh, example of where they had electrodes implanted in the nucleus accumbens septi, these animals will refuse sex, food, and water in order to get their hit of cocaine. We actually have a mouse model where the animal is addicted to cocaine from the very first hit. And these animals are used to study drug addiction. They're a genetically modified animal. And from the very first time, that they get a hit of cocaine, the animal is addicted. And these are the areas of the brain that are involved. Now, in animals, we can't know what their internal subjective state is. I mean, you know, they may be yelling, wee, I don't know. I mean, we don't know what their internal subjective state is. What we do know is that individuals who are drug addicts, for example, individuals who are cocaine addicts, talk about how they get this whole body euphoria, which is so intense, it's like nothing in normal experience. They have this intense feeling of elation that occurs from taking the drug. And so the very same areas of their brains light up, and that tells us, in fact, that very similar mechanisms 
are being used in the two cases. So whatever, you know, in human beings, we have an elaboration because we have many other areas of cortex, but basically the same pathways are involved. Another interesting finding in humans, however, and I, I, I think this is very interesting, in humans, imaging studies, where you can look at the activity of these areas of the brain and under what conditions they light up, these areas are activated when we anticipate pleasure. So in human beings, one of the reinforcing aspects and one of the motivating seeking aspects of pleasure is the anticipation of it. Now, even more interesting, I think, is that the greatest activation of the areas in human beings, the greatest activation occurs when anticipation is paired with a certain degree of uncertainty. So we're motivated to seek pleasure under conditions where, well, it might happen, it might not happen, but we're highly motivated because we get this intense jolt when it does occur. But these are areas of the brain that are designed to basically anticipate pleasure and to motivate us towards behaviors that may allow that to occur. This is being studied very intensely in gamblers who have this uncertainty as to whether or not they will win when they gamble. And these areas of the brain are just light up like Christmas trees in them. And so um, this is a very active area of research. Now, more importantly, in human beings, we know that damage to this endogenous reward system can actually abolish a person's ability to experience joy in life. And we know that not just from Phineas Gage, we know that from other individuals, uh, clinical examples, where individuals have damage to this area of the brain or they've damaged it themselves through the use of certain kinds of drugs and they are no longer able to tap into the normal joy of life. And so this is an area that is, is of active interest to neuroscientists also because of the clinical aspects of it. So let's stand back a little bit from what we've been talking about in the last few lectures. We have this huge system, this mega system, learning, memory, emotion, executive functions, this huge mega system. And within it, we have subsystems. And this reward system is one of those subsystems that allows us to engage in the world and to engage in activities that promote pleasure for us. A lot of neuroscientists have wondered about what the evolutionary pressures were for this. But if you think about it, even seeking out a mate involves you have to do something, you have to seek it out. And we're very complex beings, and so we're attracted to certain people. Uh, we are motivated to do things. So this is the system where we're motivated to seek out pleasure, and this um, also contributes to a joy of life. Now, dopamine's the major neurotransmitter here. Dopamine was one of the monoamines. Now, you just heard in the last lecture that antidepressants are given to help people who are depressed, and it increases the level of the monoamines. But I said a number of times that most of those drugs act on serotonin and norepinephrine. Why is it that dopamine isn't a target. Why is it that we don't give drugs to increase the level of dopamine to help people be antidepressed? Just think about that for a minute. All the monoamines are involved. Increased levels, you increase feelings of well-being. So why is it, I didn't talk about designer drugs that are de designed specifically to go after dopamine so that someone who's depressed can suddenly experience the joy of life. Well, the reason is because we learned very early on that increasing levels of dopamine produces mania. And so it produces this almost artificial elation or high, which can hardly be described, just like depression is a depth of an abyss which can hardly be described. Um, individuals who have manic depressive disorder, again, or what we refer to as bipolar disorder, Talk about states of intense elation. Essentially, the person is high during a manic phase. 
It's like being stimulated by a drug like cocaine. During this phase of intense high, that's exactly what they're experiencing. There's even neuroscientists and psychiatrists who go as far as saying that individuals who are bipolar become addicted to that high. And this is one group of patients that are very difficult to manage because they're very non-compliant with their meds. And all of the medications that have been designed for bipolar disorder, for this manic depression cycling of way up and way down, all of the drugs that are designed to treat this devastating disorder level people out to here. And people who experience this disorder don't want to be leveled out. They want to experience those highs because they say it's higher than anything you can possibly imagine. So they don't want to be leveled out. They want to experience the mania. They don't want to experience the depression. They want to experience the mania. So they, they are very non-compliant. Now, having said that, it's true that just in the course of normal behavior, our normal lives, we are capable of having intense joy of life. We are capable of when we fall in love. There's your perfect example. You fall in love and you're just high on it. And these are the same areas which are stimulated. But we now know that these are the areas that are stimulated when a person um, just does things that they enjoy. A person who enjoys learning all their life has these areas stimulated when they take courses or they read good books. I like to take photographs of sunrises and sunsets. I have a deck off of one of uh, the rooms of my house, and I have a swing on that deck that faces to where the sun sets on the river, which is in front of my house. And I could sit up there, and I see the sunset and all the colors, and I'm just filled with this sense of connection to the universe. That joy, that elation is a stimulation of the system. And it doesn't, uh, there's no denigration made here. Just because there's a biochemical basis or an anatomical basis doesn't make love less important to us. And it doesn't make seeing a beautiful sunrise um, over the Andes and Machu Picchu any less of a life-enhancing experience. So I have a quote Um, by an individual, David Hume, a philosopher, lively passions commonly attend a lively imagination. This is a system that allows us to imagine or to anticipate pleasure. So it's the system that kicks in that motivates us for seeking the things that bring joy. And this is also the system, notice the oxytocin, notice these other chemicals that are involved. It's also the system that motivates us towards having social interaction with other human beings. And for most people, making new friends, enjoying the people we love, this is something that brings intense pleasure to our lives and certainly something which is very important. I want to say Um, in the context of this lecture and for the lecture before, I want to recommend a number of books that I think are just wonderful. If you have someone in your family who suffers from depression, um, William Styron's book, Darkness Visible, is a wonderful way to try to gain an insight into what that experience is like for them. It can be very hard for people to understand what the depressed individual is experiencing or going through. Another person who has written some of the best books are just amazing. I highly recommend, and you notice in this class I haven't done this very often, I highly recommend anything by Kay Jamison. She's a psychiatrist who suffers from bipolar disorder, and it is because of her incredible insight into her own disorder and her ability to communicate to us what mania is like that gives us insight into why People with bipolar are non-compliant with their meds. She um, has also written a book, and this was about uh, just a couple of years ago. She wrote a book on exuberance, and I think this is marvelous. We've spent our research dollars studying depression, and that's for a good reason, because people take their own lives, people's lives are unhappy. But 
Kay points out in her book a very important point. We also need to understand scientifically, we need to understand what causes some people to have a joy of life. We need to understand exuberance. We need to know how these people are resilient, what it is about their brains that allow them to be resilient to the normal tragedies that occur to every one of us, how these people are capable of tapping into the joy of life no matter what. And so we need equally to care about depression, but also about exuberance. Thank you.